Tough talk as always is, is Dave Gilbert. Uh, this is a little bit seat of the pants, but thank you for your patience. I'm going to hand you over to Dave. A round of applause, please. <laughs> So y'all can hear me, I guess. Oh, that's loud. Okay. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Is it even still morning? <laughs> I don't even know. 11.15. Okay, it's still morning. This still works. Um, so, hi. Uh, this is my sixth speaking gig at AdventureX, and um, it's the third year in a row that I've been given the honor of being the first talk of the weekend, which means I always get to deal with the technical problems. So there's that. Um, so uh, either the organizers think I'm the, I'm the crowd draw, or they just want to get my stuff over with. I don't know. But either way, you're stuck with me. Um, I just want to get my usual disclaimer out of the way. Um, whoops. Hello. Ah. Why isn't this not working? Ah. Where's my mouse? Here it is. OK. Um, every game is different, and uh, every developer is different. Um, every game has their own unique sets and sets of challenges, and every developer handles them differently. Uh, I know that I get very inspired by listening to other developers tell me their war stories and how they solve problems, even if they don't match mine specifically. Uh, and so I'm basing a lot of this talk on my own personal experiences um, and the feedback I've gotten from my own work and the work I publish. Uh, so as with anything, your mileage may vary. Uh, and there are exceptions to every rule. So basically be warned, I'm going to be talking about myself a lot. <laughs> so you know, be, be prepared for that. Um, so quick, quick introduction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Forget it, forget it, forget it. All right, you know what? Ah. You know, I thought that the, knowing what the room was going to be like beforehand anyway. Um, yay! Uh, hi, my name is Dave Gilbert. <laughs> and, uh, I have been, uh, should I stand over there? Anyway, um, I've been a, a indie, full time indie developer for um, 11 years, which is a long time. I started up Wajidai back in 2006, and we focus on you know, niche point to click adventure games. And since then, we've released about uh, 15 games under our label. Some of them I've written myself, others I've acted as a producer and publisher for other developers. Uh, so I've seen a lot of games uh, come through our stable. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, keeping your focus. And by that I don't mean how to avoid distractions uh, or how to keep off Twitter. Um, by focus I mean keeping your project grounded and realistic, how to keep your project within a, a manageable scope. Uh, and most likely how to prevent your project from ballooning out of control and uh, enabling you to, to get it done. And the great thing about being a, an indie developer, and a lot of us here are indies, uh, we don't work for big companies, most of us. Um, we're all, like me, you're self-employed. Uh, the good thing about that, the great thing about that, is that I can literally create whatever I want. Uh, no one to, uh, there's no one to tell me what I can and cannot do. And that's awesome, and that's great. Uh, but that blessing can also be uh, a bit of a burden sometimes. Um, because since I can make anything I want, I have no oversight. There's no one telling me to focus on one specific thing. And as a result, I can often get a little overwhelmed by all the possibilities. Or, uh, on the opposite end, I get stuck on a small trivial detail. Uh, those of you who were here for my talk last year might remember me talking about how I spent weeks on one particular problem only to realize that there was no problem. Uh, this is what happens when you work for yourself. Um, and I love the oatmeal. I'm using, I use these as references a lot. Uh, sometimes having someone on top of you can be very handy. Uh, it gives you focus, gives you something to work towards. Uh, so how do you direct yourself? How do you give yourself that compass, that, that north star that can keep you on the right path and kind of guide you out of the woods when you get lost, kind of in the, in the weeds of design? <clears throat> Uh, earlier this year, I went to the Game Developer Conference in, um, in San Francisco. And uh, two narrative designers from BioWare, um, Patrick Weekes, or Weeks, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, and John Epler gave a wonderful talk called Building to an Emotional Theme. And the talk is on YouTube. You can look it up. I really suggest you watch it. Um, but during this talk, 
they briefly described a three-step process that they use, which they called vision, critique, and revision. And when I typed that out, I realized the acronym is VCR. So <laughs> that's a really good acronym for you. But anyway, um, the vision, of course, is your, your stated target, your goals, your, the objectives that you need to uh, reach over the course of a piece of content. That could mean the entire, the entire game. It could mean a small section of the game. It could mean uh, the entire series of games. It's the thing that you're trying to strive for as a developer. It could be a functional objective, like the end goal, what you want the player to do, a mechanical objective, a, um, a new gameplay element or mechanic that you're trying to create or teach or tutorialize, or it could be something even more esoteric. It could be a, an emotional objective, um, the thing you're trying to make the player feel. But before you can figure out what your goal is and what your vision is, you have to really be honest with yourself and figure out what it is you're capable of doing in the first place. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Um, where are you comfortable? And look, the comfort thing is, uh, as I've done more work and I've, uh, I've spent more years doing this, I realize how important the comfort thing actually is. Uh, there's this wonderful diagram about comfort zones, which is uh, used in, by academics, and I'm going to use it myself so I can pretend I'm smart. Uh, the green area um, is where you're most comfortable. Uh, this is the easy zone, the safe zone. Uh, it's where you're calmest and most relaxed, and um, it is also the place where you don't learn and you don't grow, and if you stay there too long, you remain stagnant. The yellow area uh, is the challenge zone. It takes effort to get up there. But when you're there, it's where all the learning happens. It's where you learn new things. It's where you grow, where the satisfaction and excitement occurs. But again, it, it takes effort. Uh, but you go too far. You go far into the red zone, the frustration zone, or you go, too, you go farther beyond that. And you can start to do real serious damage to yourself. You get frustrated, you, you shut down, and you hate yourself. <laughs> it's basically a really, really bad place to be. Uh, and I'm familiar with all three of these over the 11 years that I've been working on games. Um, one of our biggest franchises is the Blackwell series. Um, this series stars a woman and a ghost. And each game centers around the pair finding lost spirits and kind of helping them move on. And this series is, is kind of our foundation. It's, um, it brings in the most money, it's what most people know us for, it kind of what pays my mortgage and is sending my kid through school. So naturally, because this game is so important, I'm going to stand in front of you and, and slag off on it a little bit. Um, a constant criticism of the games is that the overarching backstory is kind of a mess. It contradicts itself. There's a, a lot of story threads uh, that I either ignored or I retconned or, or just plain forgot about. Um, and there are big, massive plot holes that you could drive a truck through. Sorry, uh, Lori, forgetting where I am. Um, it's a big, fat mess, is, is what I'm saying. Um, but the interesting thing is, after talking to the critics and the fans and, and other colleagues and developers, uh, that this was never a problem. The, the backstory and the overarching you know, meta story was never the game's focus. The focus was always on the characters and their interactions with each other. Um, my main vision for each Blackwell game, uh, my main priority were the ghosts that you were saving. I, I wanted you to like them. I wanted you to feel sympathy for them. I wanted you to get to know them and feel the same closure that they did when you solved their problems. Uh, that was always my main objective, my main focus. So whenever I was stuck in a design problem or a bit of dialogue or uh, some kind of narrative issue, I remember my main focus. I, had to need, I needed to aim my, my gaze towards these lost ghosts, and I was usually, usually able to get back on the right track. Um, I, no, I said, usually. Uh, inevitably, I would get stuck. <laughs> That's the oatmeal again. Uh, I would get stuck on the design. I would hit that wall. That compass would fail me. That North Star would disappear. Um, so I needed a second focus. I needed some kind of backup. Instead of focusing on the individual ghost stories, I instead focused on the relationship between uh, the two main characters, Rosa and Joey. Um, how are they reacting to what's going on? Uh, how are they changing? How is their relationship changing? And by approaching it from that new angle, um, 
it was usually enough to get me back to where I needed to be. Um, usually. <laughs> Sometimes that wasn't enough either. Uh, so I had a third backup, um, which was the games themselves. Uh, each game had several ghosts that you needed to help, and they were all tied together in some big conspiracy story. So whenever I got stuck, I'd work that angle and, and try to get back on track. Yeah, and sometimes that wasn't enough either. Um, so I'd work it from a, a fourth angle of how does this fit into the overarching series. So when people say that the overarching story of Blackwell was kind of lackluster and a bit of a mess, uh, it's because it was at the very bottom of my priority list. And yet again, this was never a problem because the goal of Blackwell was never the backstory or the overarching meta-narrative. It was the characters. It was the personal stories, um, the closure and the dynamics between people. I like writing about people. Um, so there was never a point to focusing on the backstory too much because that wasn't the focus. And this was by design. Uh, if I had to be honest with myself, and I, I usually am, uh, backstory and world building are probably the things I'm the least good at. My strengths are the characters, dialogues, personal stories. I like writing about people. It's what I most enjoy doing. Uh, and sure, I like to push myself and get better at doing world building and meta narratives and things like that, but it would be dumb to make that my primary focus. Doing that would put me square in the frustration zone and that would harm both me and the game. So being very aware of what I'm good at uh, enables me to kind of focus my efforts to where they'll do me the most good and to where they'll do me the, mo the least amount of harm. Uh, so you know what you're capable of. You can create your goals and your vision. Uh, now you have to work towards achieving that vision. And that's where the critique part of this comes in. Uh, you want to get everything playable as soon as possible and get feedback as soon as possible. I call this the prototyping stage, and most often it looks like this. This is from a very early build of my per current project, which is called Unavowed. This is someone uh, kind of um, approaching you in a, in a dark, dingy alley, obviously. <laughs> um, cheap line art, stick figure characters, placeholder dialogue, just whatever it takes to get it up and running and playable. Get your game out of your brain and onto the screen. See it in action um, and critique yourself. Um, sometimes that, that's all you need. Uh, also, you need to put it in front of testers and get feedback. Uh, this gives you some huge advantages very early on. Um, the main advantage is the most obvious one. You get feedback early. If something is really wrong or the testers are not having fun uh, or they're really disgusted and bothered by something in the game, in a bad way, uh, then you can fix and change that without having invested a lot of uh, time, money, and assets. Of course, by the same token, if they really like your game and you can reach them on an emotional level and create a positive response when the game looks like this, then you know you can be pretty darn sure you're onto something. And I know now that now when I, when I reach that point, I can move forward with a lot more confidence. And um, sometimes that confidence is all you need. The, the, that jolts to the ego. Uh, that kept, keeps me motivated. Um, if the game can be fun at this point, then it'll be even better with the final artwork. And uh, another advantage is, of course, the back and forth and the conversations you have with the testers. Um, being a, an indie developer can be a lonely thing. So when you're, when you're so close to it, all you see are the flaws. And sometimes just having those conversations uh, with other people playing your game is all you need to keep you motivated. And, and seeing cosplayers once in a while helps. I saw two people here. Where are you? Um, there they are. I see there's a Rosa and Joey cos uh, cosplay duo over there. Thank you. That, that is awesome. Um, and, but uh, getting back on track, I kind of lost my train of thought. Um, unfortunately for me, um, that did not happen right away. Uh, this section of game takes place on Staten Island. You, you and your two party members are here to investigate some mysterious goings on. So I thought I had my goal 
uh, here's my vision. You're here to solve this problem. So I threw together a bunch of placeholder art and cobbled together a playable build in, in a couple of weeks. And I put it in front of testers and nobody liked it. Uh, the response I got was that it was kind of boring. It was hard to care about anything. Um, and admittedly, yeah, it's hard to care about things when it looks like this. But again, I'm trying to generate that emotional response with the line art, uh, because then I know I really have something. So I had to really look at this section of the game and reevaluate my goals. What exactly is the reason you're on Staten Island? Not just the gameplay reason, but why do I, the developer, want you to be there? And after some time thinking about it, uh, looking back at the drawing board, the answer was obvious. Uh, it was this character uh, who you're here to meet. Uh, her name is Vicky Santina. She's this disgraced police officer uh, that you encounter on Staten Island and then later recruit into your secret organization that the game takes place in. Uh, so the real goal, the true goal of this section was to make the player like Vicky. I want you to think she's cool. I want you to uh, see what she can do, and I want you to like her. I want you to take her out on various missions. So I had to reevaluate pretty much how I did everything. So I gave her more screen time. Here she is, uh, she's now attacking you in the alley, and now you have to come to some mutual understanding. Uh, here you are fighting a sea monster together. Um, you know. What? <laughs> Um, basically, I made sure that every moment of the section, every character you meet, every puzzle you solved, reinforced who Vicky was. So by the time it was all over, you would theoretically know her very well, and you hopefully would like her. So I put this new build in front of the testers, and the response was much uh, more enthusiastic. Um, it worked that much better, so I, uh, I moved forward with the final art. Very, very confident that um, I was able to achieve my goal. Uh, I knew at this point the work was good and people liked it, and that confidence was all I really needed uh, to move in the right, right direction. So over the course of this talk, I, I realized as I was writing it that I brought up the words motivation and confidence a lot, uh, so much so that um, maybe I should have called the talk something else instead, but it was already online in the schedule, so it was too late. Um, but that is often the, the case with me. It's, uh, Often the, the reason why it takes me so long uh, to make these games is that I am extraordinarily uncertain about what step to take next. I know that my reputation and livelihood are on the line and that can be paralyzing, absolutely paralyzing if I let it. So I have to perform all of these crazy little mental tricks to try to sidestep my own neuroses and achieve that sense of safety and comfort and security uh, that enables me to move forward to the next step of design. Um, Self-health is, is very important. Uh, and speaking of, Unavowed should be coming out next year, so um, I guess we'll see how that all works out. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. So I guess, um, I don't know how we're doing on time because I don't know when this was supposed to technically start, but I guess we're open for Q&A until they tell us to stop. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Dave, would you ever have the uh, placeholder version playable? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone asks for that, not realizing how horrible that would probably be. <laughs> no, I, I couldn't even if I wanted to because often um, everything changes. I have the placeholder version, and then the new art gets made, and all of the, the, the you know all the doors and exits and hot spots change position. So it would be impossible to do that. Just the character, right there. I mean, if you could, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Example of when you found yourself in the frustration zone and how you recognized it and how you got out? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, there was the example I just gave you. Um, there was, um, yes, uh, there were several. Uh, there's this, there was this one section of Unavowed where um, you are uh, exploring this house and uh, there is this uh, another, the other recruit, the character you're recruiting, his name is Logan. He's kind of holding back these evil spirits using this magic power of his, and he's been trapped in the house for several days. And um, 
you need to save him. And I found it very frustrating because it was more, the, the section was very puzzly. You know, finding various objects that the spirits were connected to to kind of send them off. And uh, it was very puzzly and I'm, I'm not very good at puzzles. Um, I can do them, but they're not my strength. Uh, and I was really making this a very puzzly area. And I realized that uh, I was very much going to the frustration zone because I was focusing too much on the puzzles and not enough on Logan, who, like Vicky, I wanted you to like and, um, and, and kind of see in action. So I changed direction. Rather than you saving him, uh, I enabled it so you're helping him save himself. So you can see him in action and you see what he's capable of doing. So when he gets recruited, you'd want to hang around with him. So that's another example of when I was in the frustration zone. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, very much so. Um, this is going back like two or three talks ago. Uh, I talked about how I spent a lot of time um, with those uh, four characters, just writing dialogue between them, because I really wanted to get to know them well. Because uh, Blackwell, when I was still working on Blackwell, it was easy. I knew those characters. I could write them in my sleep. And I kind of didn't realize just how good I had it, knowing these characters already. and. When I started working on Unavowed and I was creating situations for these characters, I realized I had no idea how they'd react. I'm like, this is no good, uh, and this is not fun, and I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not liking this at all. So I spent a lot of time working on the characters, having them talk to each other, um, putting them in various situations. I'm like, okay, they're in a burning building, and they're talking to each other. What are they saying? Um, that kind of stuff, and kind of workshopping the characters. and. Uh, even though that is my comfort zone, I was doing more with it. And I think the whole get out of your comfort zone thing is all well and good, but it's far better to expand your comfort zone than to just get out of it completely. Because then, again, the frustration zone, it can, it can lead to damage. And especially since games take so long to make, that if you're in that frustration zone for a long time, you're, you're in for a world of trouble. So um, yeah, I focus on characters first pretty much all the time. Anybody else? Can I this one more question? Sure. Uh, I thought I saw someone over there. Yes. Yeah, um, uh, so you need to have a balance with your placeholder assets. So they're understandable enough. <laughs> yes. Um, but not spend too much time on, otherwise you'll waste loads of time. Uh, how do you balance that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, MS Paint and just, <laughs> I, I mean, pretty much it's, there's a select few people that I put that placeholder art in front of. I don't put it in front of the big testing group because I know that not everyone is going to be able to kind of read and see through the placeholder art. Um, I just try to make it as readable as possible. I make sure to add descriptions and I make sure to add, uh, just, just try to make it as clear as possible without wasting a lot of time. So uh, it is a balancing act, you're right, but uh, it, it's worked so far. Uh, is that it? Uh, I think so. I think okay, well, thank you very much, everyone.